Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Steve. This is Linux, by the way. And if you've been following along with the other videos, I recently installed Omerchi, which is the DHH distribution, and it lets you go from like zero to installed in about 10 minutes and has great defaults. It's just sort of really easy to get working with Linux and then get up and running and get straight into developing or whatever you do with Linux. And so if you haven't seen that yet, I'll include the little card at the top so you can check that out. But anyway, what I was doing is, is I was installing with Arch install and I used ext4. And since then I've switched to BTRFS, which could be called like ButterFS. And it's a B-tree based file system, which was invented back around 2007 by Chris Mason, who saw a paper from IBM at Usenix. And it's a B-tree file system, which has a lot of features that ext4 doesn't have. And they're more of trade-offs. So file systems oftentimes make conscious choices. And the B-tree FS allows you to have things like copy on write snapshots. And what copy and write snapshots do is allow me to copy a file, but not use additional space, for example. It also has newer and modern features like built-in compression, so that when you're downloading a lot of things transparently and in the background, it's gonna be compressing them and using less space, which is not only important for space, but can also be important for performance. So if IOPS are constrained, the number of IO operations you're doing, well, having less of them and having a more bin pack type thing going between the disk and the system uh, ends up with better performance, for example. Meta slash Facebook use ButterFS at massive scale, and it potentially saves them millions or hundreds of millions of dollars using some of these features. Also, Fedora defaults to this for their desktop systems, and there's a lot of different Linux distributions that leverage it to do things like snapshots, et cetera. And we can do all of that within Omarchi slash Arch Linux. It has great support for that. And so I wanted to go ahead and share that today. File systems notoriously move slow and with good reason. We recently saw Apple switch to APFS, but that took like forever. And the same thing with Linux, not because it has to, but because it's your data. And if there's a small bug there, well, you might lose photos or videos or memories or important financial documents. And so these things need to be very robust and tested. The way ButterFS is written has a lot of advantages. So a lot of the Linux people, for example, have been pretty jealous of ZFS. And because it's tricky and we can't include it in the kernel the way that other file systems are, and that's because of licensing and the way it was released. But ZFS has had a ton of features in terms of deduplication and compression and integrity checking, et cetera. And so ButterFS is one of the ways we can do that within the kernel. And so ButterFS itself has this copy and write support. So when you copy a file over, it's going to not actually do anything. It's just gonna make a small indicator that it's been moved, but it's not gonna copy like the 600 megabyte ISO image or anything like that. It's just gonna put a metadata pointer there. Once you put something else in it, like let's say you append the ISO, then it's gonna go ahead and use that extra space and start an IO operation. But you can imagine if you had like many, many files and you were copying around your file system and organizing, et cetera, well, you really get that for free, right? So I can duplicate this 20 times, still using the same amount of space at a fundamental level. And that's a huge advantage for Linux and for performance and for space savings. In past videos, you may have also seen me use LVM. And I use LVM to make file systems which are virtual. And then I put ext4 inside of there. Well, ButterFS ships with subvolumes, and subvolumes are basically that, but natively supported. And so you can divide your system up into a bunch of subvolumes, and then you can snapshot them. And so one of the great features there is, is that if you have an issue, you can just roll back. And I'll cover some tools which help you do that also. ButterFS also has support for error checking, so that way you can avoid some bit rot problems, and it has built-in RAID, which makes it reliable and redundant. So ButterFS has all the modern file system features that we want, and it's a great fit for using Omarchi and the Arch rolling release model. So all very modern components. And this is just kind of a file system to go along with that. And if you're interested in more, you can check out the Wikipedia page. There's more features here than I have time to even cover in a YouTube video, but it has defragmentation. It is online growing and shrinking your volumes. It has integrity checking. It has data scrubbing. It has sub volumes. It has atomic rights. It has everything you can want in a file system. And uh, they've done a lot of work since 2007 to mature that and make sure that it's enterprise scale. So if you're installing Omarchi for the first time, you might want to check out my other video on that. However, this is just a basic Arch Linux install, and you can do this with Arch, and it's very similar in other systems. So what we can do is we can type Arch install, and from here it's going to pull up our little installation menu, and you can go down to disk configuration and select partitioning, and then use best effort, and that's fine. And in this case, I'm in a VM, so it says virtual device. At home, make sure you pick the right device. Uh, don't pick the USB key and don't pick drives you don't want to lose. 
And what we're going to do is select ButterFS here. So previously I had ext4, just swap it to ButterFS, and we'll say yes to subvolumes, and we'll say yes to use compression. And you can see that if you actually go to the other choice, it's going to disable on copy and write, which is one of the key features. So don't select that either. And what you can see here is it's making two different types of file systems. It's making a slash boot with FAT32 so that we can actually boot into the system. And then it's going to put Linux on the ButterFS drive, which is the remaining space. And that has four sub volumes. And so we have the normal root directory, we have our home directory, we have var log and var cache pack pacman package. And the sub volumes allow us to do things like snapshot them. So we can roll them back if needed. And so, for example, my home directory is constantly changing, but my root directory should not be changing that often. Uh, var log should be changing often because I should have constant stream of logs coming in and all that. Uh, but you can see that that all kind of works together where maybe you have different volumes with different characteristics and some might compress really well, some might not. And this allows you to have that all within the file system level. So you don't actually need more tools to handle that. And as we go through the other choices, I'm actually going to skip over LVM. And that's because we have all those features built into ButterFS. However, I will pick disk encryption. So ButterFS does not support full disk encryption. So we're still going to use the Lux method to encrypt the drive. And then we'll layer ButterFS on top of it. And that works great uh, for these scenarios. And so let's pick that. And just make sure under partitions, in the original video, I didn't show this step explicitly, so some people missed it. Uh, make sure you go here and you select it with the X in the box. And then that way you'll be installing on top of the encrypted drive. And that's a way to make sure that if you sell the computer, or give it away later or anything that people aren't gonna have all your data and that that'll be safe to do. And if you're curious about how I'm setting all this up, I'm actually in GNOME boxes right now. So if I just move my mouse cursor to the top, there's a little bar that appears. And you can see here that this is a virtual machine. It's running on the B-Link SCR8. I'll put an affiliate link below. If you click that, it helps the channel, but it's also like 500 bucks and it can run a lot of VMs very fast. It works great for my usage, but uh, GNOME boxes here. So this works great. And I'm still in Omarchi. I can do dev VMs and they work really well. And the UI is pretty nice. And so everything sort of like just works really like it. And so this is not the VM. This is just my desktop Omarchi system. And I have it running here already. And so if we type mount and uh, we grep for BTRFS here, uh, what you can see is, is that I have a couple different volumes here and I have compression set to ZSTD uh, level three. And that's all looking good. And what I can do too is, is if I do a pacman -Q -L -BTR -FS progs, uh, we can see all of the various tools that come with this. So we can grep for bin here, and you can see it comes with that BTRFS tool and a couple more like BTRFSCK so that we can check out if there's any corruption or anything in the volume if we had to and rescue tools along with the normal MKFS tools. So if you want to make a new file system, everything was within the BTRFS progs package. So let's check out the snapshots real quick. Let's run date and then we'll do BTRFS test and then we'll cat BTRFS test here. And you can see that that's the date right now. And then what we can do here is we can make dir like slash snapshots. To take the actual snapshot, what we'll do is, is we'll do a ButterFS sub volume snapshot, the name of what we want to snapshot, which is just root. And then we'll put it under our snapshots directory with root and then the date put after it. And so we'll do that and you can see a snapshot was now created. So that means that now everything I do after this, we can roll back if I had to. So if I do a date BTR FS test again and cat that, uh, we'll see that it's a new date. So this was 0609, this is 0610. And now maybe I wanna roll back from this. To restore this, because it's the root volume in an emergency, what you do is you would boot with a USB key and you would do a set default on the snapshot version, and that would boot up in the older version. And there are tools like Snapper, which allow you to do this automatically. Uh, however, if we wanted to check this out, what we can do is we can do a BTRFS sub volume list on that. And you're gonna see here is our snapshot right here. And it's got a sub volume ID of 262. So what we can do is we can do like make dir mount test. And from here, what we can do is we can do a mount dash O subval ID equals 262 and then dev mapper root and do that to mount test. And then what we'll see is if we go to mount test, uh, there is our root file system. So now we have our current root file system, but I've also loaded a snapshot of it. And so what we can do is, is I'm under mount test root, which is the snapshot version. And I have one misspelling and one correct spelling. But if I cat both of them, 
uh, what you'll see is, is that we have our 0609 version, and so you can restore your files that way. You never lose data, and it's very efficient because it's only storing what changed. So it's not like I have double the storage used now. I only have that tiny little bit with just this file and the different dates, that's it. Really great file system for that. And so in order to make this video, I had to download the Arch Linux ISO. So I've switched to my user, and if I do an ls-lh on the ISO, you'll see that I have Arch Linux here, and it's 1.4 gigabytes. And if I do a df-h, and I go up for home here, I have about 18 gigabytes used on my home partition, and I'm as my current user again, I switched out of root. Uh, but anyway, what we can do is, is we can copy the Arch Linux to Arch Linux, and we'll just do like two, and then we'll do three, and then we'll do four, five. You could probably put that in a bash loop if you want to test this with a lot more. Uh, but anywho, if we do the df-h and grep home again here, uh, what we'll see is, is that the usage is still 18 gigs. So even though I have all these ISOs here, and if I check this out, uh, until I change them, they're not using more space. So you can imagine there's about a billion use cases for things like this, uh, from things like node modules or all sorts of shared library files or just binaries or backups, et cetera, whatever you have, having the snapshotting slash copy and write functionality allows you to go backwards, but it also doesn't eat up the whole drive space. And I get this all the time with my video assets. So I'm moving video assets between videos and I'm saying, okay, I want all these in this video folder and then the next video folder, et cetera. And this lets me do that without having to think about it or create like a common shared library. I can just really be fast and wild with the files, throw them anywhere, and it's all just going to work pragmatically. And we're getting the benefits of compression here. So when I do start to change stuff, it's going to compress it. And so it saves a ton of space, uh, really efficient use of the system. About a year ago on this channel, I also published a Minecraft video. I made it for a friend and they didn't really know Linux or anything. And so it's about how to use Proxmox and set up a VM there to set up Minecraft. But we can set up Minecraft servers on Omarchi and we can set up a whole bunch of them using these snapshots and it's really cool. So uh, let's go ahead and do a pacman dash SS here and we'll check out Podman, which is just like Docker, but maybe a little better. It depends on who you're talking to. I like Podman more. And so uh, we'll go ahead and install that. And so we'll say uh, sudo pacman s podman here and type in the password, do that. And it should only take a second. Boom, installed. Good. So if I run Podman here, uh, you can see there's the CLI. And then what we can do is we can pull down the server image that I like which is the it's G Minecraft server. And it's gonna go ahead and do that and download all of that. And you can see that uh, the performance isn't suffering despite all these features either. So this is going much faster than my network could. Uh, the file system itself can handle a lot of IO and be performant and that includes video editing also. So what I've done is I made a little bash script here where we're just going to spin up like 10 Docker containers. And you can see it just makes them all basically name the same with one different port and one in the name. Uh, different. And so if I go ahead and run this, uh, by the way, that's lazy Docker running. So you can have this cool terminal interface and see all the things running, but they're all downloading servers and running. And in the background there, I, this B link is doing great. Uh, if we check out like uh, B top, maybe we could see here that uh, it's not really straining under all this. The CPUs are largely unused. So if you wanted to run a whole bunch of Java processes, B link is probably a good idea for that. Uh, but what we can see here too is, is I do a df-h grep home, uh, we're still at 20 gigs and that's because of all the efficiency that's going on in the background. So even though these are downloading servers and there's 10 of them going and they're all starting up and I actually ran this once before I filmed this, so I have 10 more there, it really is being super efficient and allowing you to be super scalable because a lot of these things are going to be very similar in nature on the disk format. If we check out the BTOP again, we'll see that now that the servers are up, they're all generating worlds, which is like the maximum CPU event as they all start going. And so that's moving and they're all downloaded now. And if we check out that uh, home again, you can see, yeah, we're still at 20 gigs. The other cool part about this is like, say you wanted to build on this. Well, now you can snapshot these. So they could all be their own sub volume and you could just snapshot them. And if you wanna go back in the world, so let's say somebody logs into your Minecraft server, messes something up, whatever, it's all just built in the file system. 
And that also includes you as the admin. So you edit a file, oops, I didn't mean to do that. What was it before? Well, instead of having to have Git installed and committing to GitHub, et cetera, you could also rely as your file system to have a backup of all that. So I really like the technology and it makes a lot of things easier. And I'm gonna be looking to apply this in cloud settings soon also. What we just did also aligns with the Omarchi manual recommendations. So it says use the full disk encryption and then it says use ButterFS and it does call out compression as one of the major features there. I'll put a link below in case you want to install it or check it out. I highly recommend it. Really easy to use and straightforward if you've ever done this sort of stuff before. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel and it never gets old to have a bunch of comments talking about how I pronounce things wrong. That really helps the channel. Uh, otherwise, let me know in the comments below though what you think. Are you gonna stick with ext4 or use XFS, which I've used on servers in the past, or is ButterFS the new go-to for all new systems? Otherwise, I'll catch you in the next one. Later.